this is a very big scroll. It's appropriate, I think, to come to Israel and get a, a, a scroll. Um, and I look forward to framing it and mounting it on the wall. Um, I want to thank uh, um, Dr. Appleoy uh, for his opening comments uh, and the other members uh, on the podium, uh, Dr. Uh, Skorecki, for uh, his wonderful comments as well, um, uh, and Dr. Rosen uh, and Sidi. Um, and also congratulate uh, Charles Bennett, my co-recipient here, uh, and uh, his wonderful research. Uh, it was a uh, marvelous uh, march of discovery uh, about the universe. Um, and it's wonderful to be here. I want to thank everyone, all of you, for uh, coming and being part uh, of this uh, very memorable event for myself uh, and my family. Um, I also actually want to rethank Dr. Appleoy uh, for his wonderful phone call uh, telling me of the award uh, and all of his personal efforts uh, and that of uh, his staff for the marvelous organization and caretaking uh, of uh, my wife and myself uh, and our families uh, and also thank the Harvey Selection Committee uh, for um, this distinction uh, and the committee for making this such an elite award. I'm honored to be part of the group of physicians and scientists uh, that have won the Harvey Prize uh, and it's become a great uh, tradition. The power of the mind is uh, never greater than when it wraps itself around a fundamental problem. Now, Dr. Bennett told us about his interest, which is the origin and the dynamics of the universe. And I put that as a fundamental problem. And I am interested uh, in the origins and dynamics of life. And that's another fundamental problem in which we can truly wrap ourselves around. And these pose two of the most dynamic problems that uh, one can think about and so while there is a vast difference in many ways between physics and biology, there's a vast unity as well in the kinds uh, and magnitudes of the problems that are being addressed. And it's wonderful to hear Chuck, uh, and I'm happy to be here to tell you a little bit about uh, what I do. And at times it seems that the research that we were doing literally was a world unto itself, drawing us into a universe, a strange universe in our case, uh, of ideas and emotions. And all of you who do science know it is not just the absolute logic and the discipline, but there is a lot of challenge uh, and emotion uh, that goes into the work. And in our case, uh, the discoveries that we made were something like opening up a pyramid that had uh, not been seen before whose entrance was sealed and could only be opened by asking the right type of question. Uh, and in my view, it's all about the question and how you ask the question uh, that leads you to the answer. Well, we asked the right question in a way that allowed us to enter this wonderful pyramid and to enter a room that was filled with scientific treasure. The room sparkled with gems about how steroid hormones, these wonderful uh, small chemicals in our body, uh, actually work. Uh, common steroid hormones include estrogens and androgens, testosterone, cortisone. Um, and we discovered um, a gene that is known as a receptor that acts as a type of genetic switch uh, to unlock the genome. Uh, and the switch acts as sort of a conductor of uh, an orchestra to create a symphony uh, of genes and genetic activity. And when we discovered the first of these conductors or molecular switches, we knew uh, that we were onto something very important uh, and very exciting. Uh, and I don't think that uh, anyone in my lab slept for uh, uh, the entire uh, time that we were doing this, uh, and of course this was a problem at home as well, since uh, we were so excited about what we were doing that we never slept. We were working all the time. Luckily, my wife is a scientist, uh, and she was also 
sharing in the discovery uh, and a worker, so she understood the process. Um, and in fact, it's the most amazing and complicated uh, process uh, in understanding uh, how these uh, receptors work and what was revealed. Now, another part of this room that we entered revealed secrets about the action of thyroid hormone. This is another amazing hormone that controls body temperature and basal metabolism. And yet another room uh, revealed the secrets of how vitamin A and vitamin D work uh, in the body. Well, this pyramid had 48 jeweled rooms, each revealing the secret of a different genetic symphony. And in many cases, we are still listening to and transcribing the music, uh, which is the work that we continue to publish uh, on uh, this uh, wonderful set of genetic regulators. So my question 20 years ago, leading to the discovery of the first of these receptors, and then to many more, became a journey, an exciting journey that's taken us deep into the genome and led to the discovery not only of receptors, but of new hormones, hidden hormones, uh, that could not have been recognized until the receptors uh, for the hormones were identified. The work also led us uh, to develop technology to discover drugs that could control the activity of the receptors and therefore uh, orchestrate the activity of genes. Uh, this led us also to understand that there are hidden hormones in our diet, the foods we eat, and these also contribute to normal body physiology, but can also contribute to obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Now, obesity and diabetes and heart disease are growing medical problems uh, in Western societies, and it begins with eating high-fat diets. Now, many of us will be traveling down the metabolic road with new challenges in understanding the complications of appetite, exercise, the balance between food and leisure. And solving this problem uh, is an important part of my future in one of the great medical debates of our era. Now, as I tell everyone who joins my lab, if you want a big answer, you must ask a big question. It's not always easy to ask a big question or at the time know what the right big question is to ask. But this is the challenge that I lay down uh, to my students and postdocs. And I've had the remarkable fortune to work with a cadre of people who are not afraid to take the risk and to work on the big questions. So what are the next questions? For us, we ask, how can our studies of hormones and genes help us to understand human development, the transcriptional basis of physiology and new ways to harness and control human disease can be unlocked by studying these hormones and their receptors. Biomedical research can only be pushed forward by the next generation of students who ask these questions, and it's my hope and desire to encourage the spirit of young people to pursue science, bringing their energy and enthusiasm to help us answer these questions. And we had some wonderful musicians here who are also scientists um, and more in the audience. And the Technion is the, the model uh, for bringing young people into modern technology, uh, science, uh, biology. Uh, and I salute all of you uh, for uh, that wonderful cause. Now, science is a combination of many complicated forces that come together to produce discoveries. And my own science has benefited from a remarkable number of individuals and institutions that have shaped my thinking, refined my approach, and helped to keep me focused on the right problem at the right time. And mentors make a difference, uh, and I wish to tip my hat to Jim Darnell, and the Rockefeller University that had a wonderful influence uh, on my own scientific career, uh, reorienting me at a time when uh, I could really benefit from that thinking and that institution. And also at the Salk, I'd like to thank uh, Drs. Inder Verma and Tony Hunter, my close colleagues, and other Salk faculty, and in this case, Nobel laureates that include Renato Dobeco, 
who first hired me, Roger Guillemin, a, one of the true leaders uh, in endocrine and hormone research, Sidney Brenner, uh, a former Harvey Prize recipient and Nobel laureate as well, and Jonas Salk uh, himself for being and inspiring colleagues and teachers as well and friends. I wish to thank all my, I call them comrades in science, postdocs, students, and technicians who responded to my challenges with loyalty and dedication and enthusiasm, a special nod to Francis Crick, who for 20 years inspired me to ask the right questions. He was one of the, the great leaders at the Salk Institute. And I hope the Harvey Prize serves as a fitting tribute in recognition of all that has been achieved by those who have lived through the science and the endless discussions and debates that we've had over the many years. Most importantly, in addition to its idealistic aspects, science is a challenging and competitive discipline that requires a great deal of emotional support. I want to thank my family for their love and understanding and patience for what Francis Crick called this mad pursuit. I simply do not believe that I have been able to cope with the challenges without the support of my wife, Ellen, who is here tonight, and my daughter, Lena, who could not be here, uh, Ellen is a professor uh, and teacher of physiology at the University of California in San Diego. And my daughter, Lena, is a student at Columbia University who is exploring the mysteries of art history. Two amazing women who give me a unique perspective on what life is all about. My thanks to all of you for sharing this special day. And I'm going to end my talk by noting, and on a note of physics, that in, 18, in 1687, Sir Isaac Newton published his theories of gravity in the principles or the Principia. So all of you may be comforted by the knowledge that what stood up will now sit down. Todaroba. <laughs> <laughs>